today is World Penguin Day. How about that? Sweet. I did not realize how many countries around the world just love the penguin. You know, Batman's nemesis, one of his arch enemies. So I, I guess I can understand because, Mer uh, I should say, um, oh my gosh, uh, Burgess Meredith. Couldn't remember his name for a second. Burgess Meredith was an excellent character actor, and he did really well as the Penguin in the TV show. And yeah, Danny DeVito was all right as the Penguin as far as the uh, the one Batman movie. And, oh, wait, hang on, what? Uh, we're not talking about Batman? Oh, the Flightless Birds? Oh, I get it, I get it. You're sure about this? Ah, uh, okay. Oh, well, uh, never mind. The Daily Dope is in the air. Howdy, 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 gang. Yes, I am back once again. I am Jeff McAleer. I'm your host here at The Daily Dope, as well as the Grand Poobah of the GamingGang.com. So this is the second time around doing the stream today. Yes, always something going on. So today there was, uh, it looks like I had an update going on for my graphics card. So that had messed up the sync for the audio because the audio has been okay it's been in sync for the past well, week or so. I haven't really had to play around with it too much. Then something updates, and all of a sudden, everything's out of whack. So I was messing around with it, and I have to kind of turn my mic off to turn my speakers on after I record to see if it's in sync. So there's, so I get, if I don't do that, I get this horrible feedback through the speakers. So, of course, I start the stream, and I had the speakers turned off. <laughs> yeah. Gotta love that. That's right on top of yesterday's show where I did almost an hour and a half show and it was all devoted to Thunderstone Quest. How to play as well as my review of it. And I think it's excellent. It's an excellent game. And of course, YouTube did their weird sort of, if the stream is longer than an hour or so, they like don't render the whole thing correctly to start off with. So it's missing about 14 minutes of the hour and a half. And it's very bizarre because in my preview for enhancements on YouTube, I see the whole video, all hour 28 minutes and change, yet visitors only see a minute 15, or I should say an hour 15. Very, very bizarre. Sometimes it takes a couple of days for YouTube to actually completely render the stream. It's very bizarre. So we'll see what happens. Anyhow, I do have a pretty big show today. I do want to point out, chat is available. It's available through YouTube. It's not on screen. That's how I keep uh, some of the creepier folks at bay. And I do see that uh, one of our regulars, Drew, is saying hello. Howdy, Drew. Welcome back. Yes, and you welcome back as well. Yeah, very strange. Started off the show, and I'm talking, and blah, 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 and I... All of a sudden, Drew's watching in chat. He pops in. He says, I don't hear anything. I glance down. I'm like, oh, no. The mic volume's not on. That's okay. Brand new show. We'll start from scratch. It's all right. I didn't get that far. Anyway, so today I've got a good bit of news. An eclectic bit of news as well. Plus, I will be taking a first look at Fortress Sevastopol. Or I should say Sevastopol. I believe that's pronunciation. I don't know. It's it, it's Russian. I don't. I can barely speak English, folks. Come on. I believe it is Sevastopol. But uh, this is a uh, relatively new war game from the folks at UGG, which is a German. I believe they're a German war game company. And I believe what they also do is they also um, import a lot of uh, war games from the U.S. into Europe. Now I'm not sure if they. They do foreign language editions or not. I'm not positive. I'm not very familiar with them. But they were kind enough to send me 
Fortress Sevastopol for us to take a peek at. So it is a World War II game. So it should be pretty cool. So we'll take a peek. All right. So anyway, let's jump into the news because the newest supplement for Star Wars Force and Destiny is on the horizon. And I've got the dope from Fantasy Flight Games. That wizard is just a crazy old man, said Owen Lars in Star Wars A New Hope. The Star Wars galaxy departed the realm of typical science fiction with just a few words from Uncle Owen, snowballing into a space opera of mysterious powers and ancient religions that has enthralled generations. Yes, and I must admit, I was enthralled because I saw Star Wars in person in a theater when it first came out in 1977, wasn't it? Yeah, I think I was nine when it came out. So I got, I remember nearly peeing myself as the Star Destroyer comes. All just kept going on and on. It was like, oh my gosh. Anywho, Unlimited Power, a new source book for the Star Wars Force and Destiny role playing game expands the opportunities for mystic characters in your campaigns with three new specializations, three new species, new gear and vehicles, and adventure ideas to give any campaign a greater focus on the otherworldly. Few characters in Force and Destiny can encompass the captivating sense of mysticism and intrigue better than the mystic. Guess I would go with reasoning. I mean, that's pretty obvious, right? Mysticism would make you a mystic. As a true ally to the Force, the mystic has the opportunity to become that reclusive wizard or that crazy old man in their campaign. A true mystic seeks to be a partner to the Force, channeling it through them, using it as much as it uses them. More than just a source of power, the mystic is able to commune with the Force to determine his or her particular role in the galaxy. There's no definitive mystic, however, and unlimited power reinforces that by doubling the number of available specializations for those who walk this mysterious path. In unlimited power, you will find the tools to expand the role of the mystic in your campaign, while also granting other player characters access to new gear and equipment. Open the doors of your campaign even wider with new species, new force powers, and new adventure possibilities with unlimited power. And hey, that's odd. FFG's repeating themselves. They just said that. Literally just said that. Force and Destiny Unlimited Power will be available soon. I do not have a specific release date just yet. I'm assuming we're looking at next month. Usually with a lot of the uh, a lot of the Fantasy Flight Games RPG previews, because they have put a preview up, usually hit about a month, month and a half before it actually hits stores. But Force and Destiny Unlimited Power will carry an MSRP of $29.95. I have to admit, I, have, I, I keep saying I want to take a look at this role-playing system, but I haven't. And mainly because there are no digital editions. It's not in PDF. That was part of the agreement that Disney and Fantasy Flight Games has that uh, Disney doesn't want any sort of piracy of the Star Wars system which, of course, is going on anyway. But I always hear good stuff about this, but the one thing that I'm thrown off by, and it's because I don't know much about the game, there are kind of like three separate role-playing games, kind of. So Force and Destiny is sort of the Force users and uh, aspects of that. I thought, don't, don't you use all the books together, though? That's why it's weird to have, you know, like Force and Destiny gets a supplement. I don't know. Like I said, I have no clue. All I can tell you is I have heard really good things about the Star Wars role-playing game from Fantasy Flight Games. All right, moving right along. Strangely enough, uh, I do want to point out the kitties are downstairs again. So you may have heard Pinky clamoring on. She likes to she likes to be a little noisy during the show when she's down here. Smokey is also down here, so we may get a guest appearance of Smokey on my lap. I don't know yet. We'll find out. That's what happens. Live show. All right. Anyway, I was going to say, strangely enough, uh, even though it's War Game Wednesday, I seem to be kind of heavy on RPG news today. 
And I am always on the lookout to save you money on your role-playing games and find some unusual stuff out there too. So there is a brand new bundle of holding which might actually pique your interest. And I've got the dope. Traveler! The spacefaring gypsy knights have arrived from the conduit wormhole with a broad survey of the Clement Sector. This all-new Clement Sector bundle from Gypsy Knight Games brings you the tabletop role-playing game science fiction setting based on the Cephalus engine, an open game license adaptation of the Traveler System reference document. <sighs> Say that five times fast. Itself based on the new 2008 first edition of Mongoose Publishing's Traveler, as opposed to the oh, I don't know, a hundred other editions of Traveler over the years. Clement Sector sourcebooks and adventures adapt easily to Traveler or any proto-Traveler campaign. For just $9.95, you get all three titles in the Starter Collection. Retail value, $43, as DRM-free PDFs including the complete 270-page Clement Sector Core Setting book, the 217-page Clement Sector The Rules, plus a guide and deck plans for Clement Traveler's first starship, the Rucker-class merchant vessel. Would that be Darius Rucker? And if you pay more than the threshold price of $19.13, you'll level up and also get the entire bonus collection, with four more major supplements worth an additional $63, including Subsector Sourcebook 1, Cascadia, and 2, Franklin, plus the Anderson and Felix Guide to Naval Architecture and the Cascadia Adventures PDF. This bundle just launched yesterday, I want to say, so I do believe you've got about three weeks to take advantage of the savings I remember having the old GDW Traveler books when the first, I want to say it was the first three books came in that small black box. I picked them up back in, gosh, I would say 1980. Yeah. Yeah, I've been around a few blocks, folks. And I always liked Traveler, but then on the other hand, I always thought Traveler was just kind of um, dry really, really dry, as opposed to kind of space opera-ish, kind of pulpy. I don't know. Uh, I always thought the, uh, the character creation system was interesting. In fact, it was sometimes one of the more interesting aspects of the game, even though your character could die during character creation, putting you back to square one. All right, moving right along. I'm trying to get a little bit of war game related news out there for you. And if you are into historical miniatures, well, you'll be interested to know the latest issue of the venerable magazine, War Games Illustrated, is available. And you should take notes. Here's the dope on what's in this issue. In War Games Illustrated, issue 367, we take a look at the horde of new releases available at Salute 2018. Wasn't that last month? I don't know. For some reason I thought that was last month. Maybe I'm wrong. Dunno, I know it's across the pond. Pete Brown kicks off the theme by taking readers to the Bronze Age and outlines how to create a campaign system around the collapse of empire. There's Burroughs and Badgers. Michael Lovejoy explains the process behind the creation of the rules for his range of uh, anthropomorphic Boy, that's a hard word to get out. Animal Fantasy Miniatures, which are coming soon from Osprey. Simon McDowell tells a story of the catastrophic defeat of the Roman army by the Goths in 378 AD. The Battle of Assel Uttar. The Second Indo-Pakistan War, 1965. Steve Blees presents an ambush that take, took place during a war whose events still have repercussions today. Then Pete Brown discusses the wargaming potential of the collapse of the Aztec and other Mesoamerican empires. I swear, what is with the Mesoamerican stuff? Every time you turn around, there's new Mesoamerica games out there. Tabletop games, miniatures games, role-playing games. I'm not saying this is bad. 
it's just weird how in in gaming we'll see just all of a sudden just a slew of games are kind of on the same topic kind of strange there's also faith in blood jamie gordon discusses his new rules for skirmish level gaming during the crusades era and offers some exclusive rules for one of the latest giants and miniature figures maybe that's a company i am not sure all of this and plenty more and trust me there is plenty more in the sell sheet for this month's issue and i do want to point out that this issue is eight pages longer or bigger than usual you can score the new issue in print for six dollars and 99 cents or digitally for five dollars and 50 cents gotta say I used to pick up War Games Illustrated quite a bit when I was doing a lot of historical miniatures. Uh, it, it was one of the magazines. The Courier was a magazine I picked up all the time. Now I'm going way back, right? And then uh, M1, which was the, I want to say it was the Midwest War Gamers Association newsletter. And uh, the person who ran that, his name was Hal, I think it was Thinkland or Thigland. And it was excellent. I, one of these days, I've got a stack of them. I used to have tons of them. Uh, but I, I think I only have maybe about 10 issues that I've been able to hang on to with all the moves over the years and so on and so forth. But I should show them off one day. Maybe because uh, the thing is, I know there are a lot of issues that are available now, uh, back issues, and I want to say they're available through Wargame Vault as PDFs, as downloads for about, I think about $4 each. And that was, I, I wanna say that, I think that was the cover price back in the day. So yeah, uh, I used to pick up a lot of these magazines when I was doing historical miniatures. Uh, I did a lot of 15 millimeter. I didn't do a lot of 25s. Fantasy stuff like that, yes, of course I went with the bigger miniatures, but uh, my American Civil War collection, which was massive, uh, that was all 15 millimeter. All right, so Moon Ride Long, staying with kind of war games. Legion War Games has an epic new title available for pre order, and I've got the dope on Prelude to War Europe 1936 to 1939. It's a detailed historical simulation game, fast paced and very interactive, that recreates the political, diplomatic, and military maneuvering that preceded the outbreak of the Second World War. Players advance their goals through actions such as diplomacy, appeasement, intimidation, agitation, pact offers, embargo enforcement, military aid, minor country conflict arbitration, regime consolidation, annexations, partitions, or military invasions. In addition to exploring a number of alternative but plausible courses of history, the game focuses on detailing the chain of events that led to the various crises, the inner workings behind their resolutions, and the various aspects of their consequences. The diplomatic wrangling and muscle flexing between the major powers is translated into a challenge mechanism where players stake national pride and international credibility until one side caves in or the escalation culminates in a final test of nerves that determines the victor. The resolution of these challenges does not involve any dice rolling and is essentially a mind game based on bluff and risk management. Really sounds unique. Currently, Prelude to War is part of Legion's CPO program. And if you're not familiar with that, it's sort of like GMT's P500, where GMT says, well, if we get 500 pre-orders, we'll actually print this. It's about 875 usually. Shh. Anyway, sounds better P500 than P875, right? Anyway, Legion looks to achieve kind of the same thing, but with 300 pre-orders. Now, this just went on the pre-order as far as I know. It is priced at $90 right now. If it does go to print, it will carry an MSRP of $120. This does seem... Pretty interesting. Sounds kind of cool. I have to say, I have always been a big fan of Hearts of Iron from Paradox. Inter uh, Paradox Interactive, I think, is what they're called now. They've kind of changed their their thing. If they were Paradox Entertainment. They've been different stuff. 
great company, don't get me wrong. Stellaris and stuff like that. Crusader Kings 2. All those great games. Uh, there's... Uh, what, the, what the heck is it? The uh, Europa Uni Universalis, I think it's pronounced. Which is funny. I can't pronounce the game. But I've played like all four editions of it. <laughs> so... This kind of has a vibe, a little bit of Hearts of Iron. Uh, not necessarily the latest edition, but the edition before that, where he had a lot of historical elements and historical events would pop up and you would have to decide, what are you going to do? Which is kind of the paradox thing with uh, a lot of their games, which I like. I like a lot. All right, so my final news piece is another RPG news piece, but I got to say, this is a bundle over at Drive Through RPG which is turning a lot of heads because you can score over $488 worth of digital RPG content for, wait for it, $25. That's right, $25. And I got to point out, this isn't a bundle that's just a lot of junk. I've got the dope on the 2018 Contessa Bundle of Awesome. Okay, so first off, if you aren't familiar, Contessa is a gaming organization dedicated to making tabletop gaming spaces more diverse by bringing minority-led events to conventions, both virtual and in person. They run innovative and unique tracks featuring games, panels, workshops, and seminars led entirely by the historically underprivileged, and it's open to attendance by anyone. I know they've got some stuff cooking at Gen Con. I would take a guess of probably at Origins, but I think they I think they have a heavier focus on Gen Con because I think they do a lot of RPG stuff. Anyway, their event runners are volunteers who pick their own games and content, making every Contessa event as unique as the Contessans who run them. Here's the dope on some of the highlights of the bundle. It includes... Core rules for the Doctor Who role-playing game. The core book for Cryptomancer. There's the Fear Itself 2nd Edition core book. The core book for New, the science fiction role-playing game, which is version 1.2. There's a Dark Eye Adventure book. It's a solo adventure book. And there's even the Torg Day 1 Adventures. And a whole lot more. I'm not kidding. This is a smoking deal. And very rarely, very rarely do you find a bundle that's giving you almost $450 in retail value from these PDFs for such a small fraction. We're talking $25. A lot of times you run across the bundles and you save maybe, you know, at best... I think 80% off in the bundles is what I've seen in the past. Usually, they're not even that much. Maybe 25 30%, maybe half. This is a smoking deal. And you can do some good at the same time by supporting Contessa and their mission of inclusiveness in gaming. Do want to point out, because it is drive through RPG, even if this is a big bundle here, amazingly enough... If you do visit thegaminggang.com before you go to drive through, click on one of our drive through banners and make a purchase, I believe we still get a little tiny piece of the action there. And I say it all the time, these small portions, these little, little drips and drabs from purchases over at drive through RPG really help because they really do add up. All right, so that is it for the news today. Whew. Need another sip here. I'm just blah, 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 rambling on and on and on. Uh, boy, it is awfully dry down here today. And I was kind of running around getting everything set up last minute. Uh, pretty busy. I almost didn't have a show today, but uh, I was able to luck out and get back in time. So I was like, okay, I'm doing a show. Why not? So, before I jump into the unboxing of Fortress Sevastopol, I want to point out tomorrow's show, Thursday's RPG Day, I am actually going to have a first look and actually kind of review a uh, PDF from uh, Pinnacle Entertainment for their Savage uh, 
Savage Worlds line, why am I sort of all of a sudden I'm like, uh, 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 what am I trying to say here? Anyway, it is the Savage Seas of Naewon, and it is part of the Lankmar line. So if you are a fan of Fritz Leiber's Fofford and Grey Mouser's series of books, you will definitely want to check that out. It's a pretty cool PDF. It's coming to Kickstarter in May. I want to say it's May 1st. It's only running for a couple of weeks. But the fine folks over at Pinnacle sent me a copy because uh, Jody Black over there reached out and said, Hey, you know, I always like how you're very upfront, very honest about your reviews and that. How would you like to uh, check out uh, our new Kickstarter? So there you go. So I'm going to uh, share that. Of course, it's a PDF, so it's going to be some slides I'll have to put together from some of the images and that. But still, pretty cool. Wait, I'm giving it away. I'm, I'm telling you, it's pretty cool. Uh, tune in tomorrow. Find out what I think. Then on Friday, hey, I'm going to review of Dreams and Shadows from Greenbrier Games. This is a pretty epic kind of game. So uh, so tune in for that. So uh, so I hope you uh, checked out my, uh, my review of Thunderstone Quest because I did something a little different yesterday on the show. I, I did, the entire show was devoted to Thunderstone Quest. And no one watching could say, well, now I, I still don't understand how to play that game. Now, I pretty much ran through, <laughs> through everything, but it is massive. It is, it is huge. So, and there is tons of stuff. And I have gone through now, finally, last night, I was kind of inspired to uh, sort everything out in a different way than I had previously in the big, huge cube. So I did, uh, did want to mention that uh, I have had a couple of people reach out. One person commented on the video. I think it was on the video. Maybe it was on Twitter. They were curious, what's going on with Thunderstone Quest? Because that big cube is selling on the secondary market for anywhere from two to $300. And uh, it is the champions level pledge packet package, I should say, that uh, I was showing off. And they were kind of curious, well, what's going on? How, how can I play this game? I don't want to spend 200 bucks. Didn't want to mention, I believe, AEG is going to have an announcement about the retail edition of Thunderstone Quest the end of this month. So I'm taking a guess it might be. I'm not positive. It might simply be uh, like the core cards, core rules, maybe a couple of the quests. Because there are five quests in that big, big monster 15-pound box. So that's what I'm kind of guessing. I'm not positive. I don't know for sure. Anyway, moving right along. Since it's War Game Wednesday, let's take a look at a war game. Because I've got a first look at Fortress Sevastopol from Udu Greb Game Design. I think that is how it's pronounced. I don't know for sure. Come on. You watch the show, you know I treat English like a second language. It is designed by Christian Deidler. Taking a guess, that's uh, that's the name there. It is for two to four players, ages 12 and up, and it will play in about two hours. So it, uh, so Drew chimes in. I read a while back they're going to break it up a bit for retail. That's what I would take a guess as far as Thunderstone Quest. That is my guess what they're going to do. I don't know how they're going to break. I, I don't know if they're going to just do one quest and the core components and maybe sell it for $35, $40. I mean, that's an idea. I'll tell you one thing, uh, which is funny. We're starting to talk about <laughs> Fortress Sevastopol, but I always like to, uh, to respond to questions in chat. I am really looking forward to the different quests that, uh, that will hopefully be coming from AEG because it is really, really cool how there's five quests, but there's different chapters to the quests too. So I really, really dug what they did with the uh, the new edition. That's why I gave it a 9.5 out of 10. It's that good. My only knock on it was uh, four players, it kind of drags a little bit. And it wasn't really because of the players taking too much time. So like two to three players, awesome, fantastic. I mean, four is fine. 
it just felt like it was just a little bit longer than I wanted it to uh, to be chiming in at. So I've got uh, got that set up, got the uh, new camera on. I should ask, uh, yeah, I think the sound should be in sync because I didn't have this camera on and sometimes that affects the sound being in sync. So fingers crossed that we're okay. All right, so let's switch on over to the other camera and take a look at Fortress Sevastopol. So one thing I'm going to point out here is I also received I, the, the um, UGG. I'm going to say UGG for short. And uh, uh, so Drew says, I had the old editions and sold them. We just never got it to the table. The first edition of Thunderstone was very, very difficult to kind of get into. Once you wrapped your head around the game, it was really good. The problem was getting it to uh, to actually be, you know, where you could wrap your head around it. Uh, Thunderstone Advance, they did a much, much better job. So, but now Thunderstone Quest just, I mean, it blows the doors off of any of the Thunderstones before. Anyway, so I was going to say, so UGG sends me this. I believe it's the game map, map, I should say. I'm not sure if uh, maybe for some reason <laughs> there wasn't a game map in here or possibly that uh, this is a larger map. So we're going to find out. But first, we're going to take a peek at Fortress Sevastopol. And looks I mean, the map looks pretty cool. So this is the weird thing that I noticed about the game here is if you look down in this section here. Eh, let's see. Let's zoom in a little bit. Zoom in. There we go. This section here looks identical to GMT's box. So I think it's kind of like kind of weird. It's like right there, the complexity, it's the same complexity. You know, the one to nine kind of broken up three, three, three. Solitaire suitability. So I thought that was kind of kind of strange. Kind of strange. So as far as I understand, the uh the premise of the game is that uh, one player is going to be the Germans trying to uh, trying to take uh, the Crimea and Sevastopol during, uh, I believe, about October 1941, because I know Hitler wanted that taken by winter, so they'd have a nice jumping off point the following year. And so, of course, one player is the Germans, and I believe the other player is going to be the Soviets. So let's crack this on open. And like I said, I have never encountered anything from this company before. They did just send me, I want to say it's a, it's a title coming to Kickstarter. They wanted to, for me to do a uh, kind of a Kickstarter preview. And the game is called Heroes vs. Warlords. And obviously, it's a prototype that they sent. It's kind of like a, you know, like a beta that they sent me. Looks kind of odd, kind of, kind of bizarre. All right, so let's take a look, see what we got. All right, so we got four six-sided dice. We've got the rule book. Ah, uh, pretty standard looking. War game rule book from what I can see here. Kind of looking, uh, kind of looks like the sort of rule book we would find from, say, um, like Legion War Games, for an example. Looks, uh, pretty, pretty traditional. Talking about, uh, different units. Yeah, game components, the map. Different units. Looks like we've got a pretty standard looking counters. Uh, unit counters in this. Markers. Abbreviations and glossary. Campaign game setup. Sequence of play. Oh, there's a chit draw. All right, so we got a chit draw. So that's cool. That's a uh, little more modern. I like war games with chit draws. I like the fact that it's not always I go, you go, or you go, I go. I like a uh, little, uh, little chaos in there. As long as, well, uh, depending on 
the scale. I, I, I believe this is going to be a much larger scale. This is more, I believe, a strategic game than anything else. Uh, as far as the Chitra, the only thing that uh, some games I have encountered that I did not like is you don't have opportunity fire. Uh, especially when you're looking at kind of a tactical level game and they've got a chit draw. It's kind of like squad levels. Uh, and you're like, well, seriously, there's no opportunity fire. Mm, that's, that's bad design. If it was, I go, you go. Yeah. Okay. I could be a little more forgiving of, of no opportunity fire, but anyway, moon ride along. See, I'm off on a tangent again, as usual. So we've got stacking, zones of control, area statuses, impulses. Uh huh. All right. Movement, assault, assault resolution. Ah, amphibious invasion, activate a contested area, bombardment. Command, refit, and supply. Administration, the advantage. Zones, fortifications, and improved positions. Artillery, naval fortress, and air bombardment. Special units. Railroads and bridges. Yeah, it seems like there's quite a lot in here. Although, funny enough, I think it was showing that it has a uh, complexity of like five. I don't know, this isn't looking like a Complexity 5 game to me. Although, I have to point out, and I have to laugh, because even somebody, I believe, just commented on one of the videos talking about, uh, what what's with GMT? It's like everything they come out with now is sort of like, oh, it's medium complexity. It's like a 6. 6 on a scale of 1 to 9. And some of the games, yeah, they're, they're kind of medium complexity. And others are like, well, wait a second, man. This is pretty complex. What are you talking about? <laughs> sort of like, uh, is GMT afraid to say, okay, well, this is complexity eight. What was, there was a complexity nine. Which one is it? Is it World at War? I think it might be World at War. Is, uh, one of, one of the few, uh, complexity nine GMT games that I know of. All right, and then it talks, we've got, uh, some, uh, online resources. So not too shabby. Kind of cool there. All right, so we got some charts and tables. Uh-oh. I don't know. Just paper. Just paper for the player aids here. Uh, okay, I guess. I mean, this is kind of a small company. I'm not going to, you know, I... I sat there and, and recommended Victory Point Games titles back when all their stuff was like desktop published so I guess I really shouldn't say too much and as far as war games go having a, an MSRP of around $45 that's uh, that is very reasonable as far as most war games go so we got that alright so let's take a look at some of the counters here Huh. Okay, so strangely enough, okay, I'm not sure why. So we've got a we've got a mounted map in here, and then we got this paper map. Well, let's take a look, see what's going on there. All right, so we've got looks like we've got control markers. Yep, looks like these are probably control markers for for area control. As we see, we've got German and Soviet on the back. Oh, look, it's a chit. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks for telling me it's a chit. So, uh, no doubt these are, uh, mm, I guess, look at that, snafu. Maybe these are kind of like special events. Kind of looks almost like special events. Event chits. So, and then we've got the units here. So, we look, it looks like we've got some pretty standard uh, counter types. So, I'm taking a guess. I didn't... Take a close look. It looks like we're probably looking at attack, defense, and then movement. Probably somewhere along those lines. Looks like we've got some railroads. And of course, dual sided. Wall breached. Huh. Okay. 
All right, and then looks like we've got the units, kind of standard iconography. Well, strangely enough, they're not going with NATO iconography for artillery and tanks. I don't know. Mm, yeah, that's kind of strange. All right. So we've got these counters here. Then we've got this mounted map. Mounted board, I guess I should say. Uh, let's get this puppy opened up. Nah, I'm sure I'm not going to be able to get the entire map into a shot here, but let's see what we got. All right, so so we've got a record track here. Looks like we've got some Luftwaffe boxes here, Soviet Air Force. So I'm taking a wild guess. Maybe the Germans should be hanging out on this side of the board. And then the Soviet player could probably be hanging around on this side of the board. Let's over here, the bottom portion here. Okay, so uh, I guess that was general tracking. So I guess you put different counters to track various things on the other track up top. Here's the turn record track. So that's kind of cool. And then we got the impulse track. So CBA 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 13. So I see we've got kind of a, I want maybe not necessarily a point to point movement, but it looks like areas here broken up into areas on the map as opposed to hexes. So that's a bit different. That looks like we've actually got a map of the city. So we've got kind of a kind of a uh, drill down into the city itself right here, which would be right over here. So that's uh, that looks kind of interesting. And up top here on the other side, show a Ukraine zone and then other areas here. Now, I'm not sure if this is a highway, I'm guessing maybe this is highway or maybe this is railroad. But I would I would assume there's roads throughout the rest. So this might be railroad as far as uh, reinforcements and supplies and things like that. So that's kind of cool. All right, so let's take a look. Now, it's possible that this is just an additional map because I know there are people who there are gamers out there who like the paper maps because then they can lay down their plexiglass or real glass on top of the maps to keep them flat. I've never been a huge fan of that simply because um, especially plexiglass plexiglass gets scratched pretty pretty easily. This looks like this is the same, same map. No, nah, bit, no. Nah. Yeah, same thing. So we've got uh, the area up here. There's the general record track. So this is kind of the um, terrain key up here. And those were area port. No, that is a rail line. Yeah, I was right. So that is a rail line. So we've got that. Yep. So here's the rail line that runs through that I was pointing out. Yeah, it looks just like kind of a different design to this too. Whereas the rail line looked much bigger, much thicker, different colors. So yeah, this is uh, kind of different. So I'm not sure maybe this is the revamped map. I don't know. I will have to find out. It does look kind of interesting. I will say that it's tackling uh, a subject that hasn't been gamed to death. That's for sure. It's certainly not another <laughs> another Battle of the Bulge game. So uh, granted, it is yeah, Eastern Front, and there's a lot of Eastern Front stuff out, of, out there right now and more on the horizon. 
but uh, the siege of Sevastopol is not something that I'm overly familiar with historically or uh, game-wise. So I don't know how many games kind of really delve deeply into it. So anyway, so that's the additional map. Like I said, I'll, I'll have to find out if that's uh, kind of an updated map that's been sent along to me or if it's just the same map. So I don't know. Anyway, so speaking of maps, yeah, because see how the, the sea color is different. This looks like more detail on this map than on that map. Don't know. But anyway, so we've got the map. We've got the two counter sheets. We've got the paper charts and tables here. Yeah, I can tell. And, and I mean, this is really flimsy paper, too. So I can tell uh, those will get trashed pretty quickly. Then we got the rule book and the four six-sided dice. And that is what we find when we take everything from Fortress Sevastopol outside the box from UGG. And of course, you can visit their website at UGG.de and uh, you can't find English, too. So it's, it's not only in German, so there is an English translation. As I mentioned, the game itself is for two players, ages 12 and up, and plays in around two hours. And it carries an MSRP of 43.45. It's based on uh, exchange rates right now. So that could change a little bit. All right, so that is today's show. So once again, if you are not watching The Daily Dope, be sure to go and visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV. You know the drill by now. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Once again, I'm Jeff McAleer. Tomorrow I will be back taking a look at the Savage Seas of Naewon for Savage Worlds. So until then, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. It is hump day. And, of course, as always, thank you so much for watching.